Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's had a great day at Python 2013, Python Today 2013 so far. Uh, welcome to the Lightning Talks. Just a quick reminder of the format. Um, each speaker has at most five minutes. Um, if they run over, we will pull them from the stage. Yes, yeah, striking with lightning. Um, and we're going to put in as many talks as possible between now and 25 past four. Um, we might not get through all of the ones we have lined up. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to David Seward, who will be speaking to us about Ask Not What Ninja IDE Can Do For You. Hi, uh, this is a bit more formal and big than I was expecting, so if I faint and fall over, you know why. Um, friends, colleagues, Pythonistas, I came here today not to praise PyCharm, but to bury it. <laughs> I would like to present to you, um, again, sorry, I was expecting like a, a small, intimate crowd. Um, I would like to present to you two logos and ask you, in all honesty, which of these two did I print a little bit bigger than the other? <laughs> the one on your left. <laughs> is the logo for Ninja IDE. Ninja is not just an IDE. It is an IDE in need of help. <laughs> Who here speaks Spanish? Some of the uh, tickets that have been listed here on GitHub are in Spanish. I, I don't understand them. I also don't actually do any programming outside of work. Um, so I get really into like little open source projects that I find out about. Shout out to any Rabbit BCS users. <laughs> it is written in Python as well. Um, so, but I realized last year at, at PyCon, like, but there's, I have this platform, this great resource. All I need to do is get one of you that went to Stefano's talk about like, Python and Debian and stuff, like get a few people, even just one person like interested and then maybe eventually like one day, six months, a year, uh, the next LTS, um, I, will, I will be able to like use Ninja IDE. Um, in a little bit of, a uh, little bit of a serious note, um, pragmatically I think that PyCharm is probably one of the like number one choices in terms of using an IDE right now. Uh, they just came out with the whole premium Apache angle plus pay if you want like extra cool features. Um, so I mean I have no more excuse not to use it anymore and quite frankly I'm getting a bit sick of G-Edit. Um, uh, but uh, the difference is that Ninja IDE is written in Python not Java. I think that writing a Python IDE in Java is, I don't know, there's something sick about the kind of thing that people put on the internet. Um, <laughs> um, so it's in, it's, it's in Python for Python, and it's GPL v3, which is obviously nice and open source, and either you're already convinced by that or not. Um, so anybody that's interested, uh, GitHub, Ninja-IDE, a bunch of uh, very funny uh, Spanish-speaking guys from somewhere in South America. <laughs> Um, great. Um, next up, we have uh, Rosemary Sassfeld, who will be telling us about the Ammonia project, which is a project to teach Python to school children um, currently in Cape Town. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so, I don't know who of you have heard of Ammonia. Uh, we've been going for quite a while. Um, I've been involved with it for about a year or two, but before that it was a UCT project that had been running for a while. And what we do is we teach usually high school age children, sometimes younger, how to program using Python. Um, and we aim to help in particular kids that wouldn't otherwise have exposure to this kind of thing, uh, either because they don't have IT facilities at their school, or they don't have uh, an IT teacher, just a cat teacher, or whatever, I don't know how much you guys know about the South African education system. Uh, CAT just kind of teaches you uh, basic kind of Excel skills and that kind of thing. 
Um, so the reason we do this is not necessarily to get kids into serious programming for a job. I mean, that's one reason. But as a hobby or just to improve the computer literacy, their understanding of how a computer works. Um, and we have had some really, really awesome people helping us out. So uh, I'm from the Precult, uh, yeah, I'm with Precult, a developer there, and the two other organizers of Ammonia are uh, Nina Schiff, who's not here right now, and Lindsay Lawrence, who's sick today. Um, they're both uh, Amazon engineers, and we usually organize these, but we've had so many contributors from uh, UCT students, a few Stellenbosch students, other software engineers all over Cape Town coming to tutor over weekends because our course format is we have a, a hard copy of course material and then we run a tutorial, well, a bunch of tutorial sessions over a weekend giving kids a crash course in Python over one weekend. Um, so the reason I'm actually standing here is we need some help. Uh, all our stuff's on GitHub, in particular our course material. And if you feel like sharing some of your Python knowledge and improving our course material, you can find Ammonia on GitHub and you can contribute. Uh, we need a few things in particular. Um, we'd like translations for our course material. At the moment, it's only in English. We'd really like other South African major languages. So if you can speak one and you can translate it for us, you would be absolutely awesome. Um, another thing that we would really like to do at the moment, we don't have the resources to carry on after we've done a course weekend and kids know how to program, they're already fired up, they want to do more things, they want to build little games, and we don't have the resources to keep educating <coughs> them further, nor do their schools or their parents. So um, one thing is there are things like Learn Street and Code Academy that let children teach themselves online how to code. Uh, this isn't accessible to everyone but some people can access it at their schools or at home. And where it is possible, we'd like children to be able to carry on their education using that. And that requires us to update our course materials so that they are in the same order as Code Academy um, and with little you know, snippets saying, okay, you can go do this exercise of Code Academy, or you can do it with pen and paper in your book. Because we think there's a lot of value in ki giving kids a hard copy of the course material since many of them won't have access to a computer for a while, but they could still do some exercises, you know, just pen and paper exercises. Um, so that's another thing we would really, really like. And then there was one more thing, which I can't remember right now. Anyway, <laughs> but we are on GitHub, so please contribute. And if you guys would just like to be a tutor in one of our future events or like to help out in any other way, you can contact me. Uh, Lindsay isn't here today, but she might be here tomorrow. Um, and uh, we can add you to our mailing list. Um, yeah, thank you. That's it. <laughs>
um, change the passwords that it needs for a database. You should be able to just redeploy it and it'll build new configuration and just work. So our solution for this is a fairly complicated set of overrides. Um, the library we're using to do this is public. It's called Yo Configurator and it's on GitHub, um, public as of a few minutes ago. Um, and obviously you don't need to do this. We just think that this approach is a fairly good one and it works well for us. So in this example, well, in this piece of code I'm showing you here, configs dirs represents the, a directory that contains um, configuration for all of your applications. Um, you can ignore the first bit. The more interesting bit is common, which really is for all the um, applications. And down here we've got some overrides that come on top of the configuration that we got from the app itself. So we see app dir, that's configuration that comes from the app. Um, we support deploying the same application in multiple environments and multiple clusters. So you can have your production environment, your QA environment, every development, and every developer's own machine is a different environment. <coughs> we call that local. Um, and maybe you've got multiple clusters that need slightly different configuration. Your machines in the east coast of US talk to just different databases than the ones in the west coast of US, or whatever. Um, so these are the things we do. Um, Configuration is all very simple. It's little Python scripts that look something like this. Um, they basically generate a dictionary that has fairly standard structure. It's got, um, there's a section for DB for anything that talks to a database. There's whatever else it thinks it needs. Lots of Django applications end up with these two things. You, you get the idea, it's all very simple. This is an application's default configuration file. It says this is the configuration. These are all the, wherever there is a sensible default, it's in here. And wherever there isn't a sensible default, but we really need something, if there's not anything there, it must blow up when you try and deploy it. You put this thing in that's a missing value, and if you don't replace that with something later, it will blow up. Um, hopefully not too spectacularly. So you can see this application is full of all sorts of secrets like usernames, passwords, um, AWS keys, and none of that's actually in the app repository itself. This app could, it isn't public, but some of our applications you can see on GitHub are public and you'll see configuration like this in there. There's nothing secret in it. Um, if you're in the local environment, you can see npub local, then it should configure itself for running on a developer's own machine. It should not put stuff in var log, but rather a directory inside the Git repository called data. It should use a SQLite database rather than MySQL, you know. The, sense, the things you would want to do to make it run on your machine. Um, this application's really simple. It only has a default and local configuration. But if we go over to our deploy configs repository, which has got everything in it, configs. You can see configs for all our apps, for all the environments, and a whole bunch of common stuff. Um, I've tried to redact it a bit, so hopefully there are no passwords in here. Um, Here's our production configuration, which says, take the default configuration, and by the way, just configure it to talk to Sentry. There's a URL for the Sentry it should talk to. Um, I can't even know what dry run is for. It, it does some stuff that affects EC2 instances, and we tell it actually do that when you're in production. Um, there are also all the passwords that we couldn't put in the app repository. We put in the deploy configs, it, the secret repository that, um, has all the passwords in it. And you can see none of them are actually here. So you're not going to learn much from that. Um, I guess that's about it. And then you can build this together. So I say configurator, configurator, uh, build a version, build a configuration for it for our QA environment with, that's lo with, for running locally. And it'll build a configuration.json file which has all the configuration it needs. And it can now read that in Django, can read that from the settings.py, any other app can read it however it wants to. Thank you. Jason Norwood Young, who's going to tell us about hack hackers, hack or hacks hackers. hackers. Yeah. 
Hi guys, uh, hacks hackers. Uh, hacks as in uh, journalists, hackers as in new guys. Uh, it's a group, an international group, um, that uh, is pretty big internationally. Uh, we just, I just went to a conference in Buenos Aires uh, where there were uh, over a thousand attendees um, uh, from the hacks hackers groups worldwide. And uh, the, the just the Buenos Aires chapter, well, not everyone was present, but at, uh, I think they, they've got over 2,000 members in total just in that one city. Uh, Cape Town, we, uh, we've, we're just kind of getting it going at the moment. Um, depending on the day, I think we've got about, about 30 members or so, so far. Um, and basically what we do is we put uh, uh, developers who want to work on something a little more interesting than punching out code for an enterprise, um, uh, together with journalists who so are looking uh, for help with things like uh, data analysis, um, building really cool uh, data journalism apps, um, building kind of, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, some of the New York Times uh, uh, kind of very interactive app applications like Snowfall, um, and there, there are quite a few really, well, they're, they're basically data journalism is kind of really blowing up, and there are lovely, lovely apps out there uh, connected to websites like the New York Times, The Guardian, um, that uh, basically we need, well, we want South African uh, publishers to start building, but they don't have the skills here. So the one thing that we want to do is impart skills into the newsrooms. We want to um, uh, have uh, uh, developers go in there, hack, hacks go in there, and or hackers go in there, and show the hacks how to do a basic spreadsheet and uh, uh, how to start extracting real value and real data off of that how to start interrogating data and uh, finding out stories that you might not have known existed if you didn't know how to look into that data and how to read it properly. So an example would be the, the recent uh, crime statistics where a lot of the, the journalists just kind of um, parroted what the, the government told them, which was that there'd been a crime reduction, but pretty quickly some uh, more kind of data savvy journalists and, and uh, hackers had a look at the data and realized if they normalize the data for the increase well, for the changes in population, that uh, in often cases there was actually a crime increase. So even though the, the actual number dropped, the, the number per you know, 100,000 uh, uh, figure had actually risen, especially for violent crimes. So it's that kind of stuff we need. Um, there are a, a bunch of programs attached to, to Hacks Hackers. Well, the, fir the first thing we do is we have a, a monthly meetup where we might have a cool guest speaker. We might, uh, I think the next one we're going to do uh, mapping. Um, so if you guys are interested in maps and making really beautiful, cool maps using real data, uh, that'll be the next one. So we get guest speakers uh, from South Africa and internationally. We have hackathons. Um, and yeah, apart from that, it's very community driven. So whatever you guys want to, to get involved in, that's cool. And then there's a, another program, Code for SA. Um, where they've got funding uh, to uh, embed uh, a hacker into uh, uh, into newsrooms in, in in South Africa, so it'll be like a, a, a like a probably about a three month in, uh, period where you're embedded, you impart skills, uh, you uh, kind of get them excited about data journalism and try to create a real cult cultural change and get data journalism really running in South Africa. Cool, that's me. Thanks very much. Um, we're just going to take a moment um, for Michael to get set up. Uh, Michael, I didn't suppose you feel like doing some more chuckling. Oh, wait, uh, where are my props? I, I forgot to tell him how to get in touch with me. Yes. So I'll tell him. Um, oh, hold on a second. So uh, I forgot to tell you, uh, the we've got a Google group, hacks hackers slash Cape Town, or hacks hackers hyphen Cape Town at googlegroups.com, and you can sub subscribe to hacks hackers. Well, it might even come up. There we go. There it is. Okay, there we go. So you guys can subscribe over there. Okay. I can kill it. Now I can kill it. Okay. Yo. Um, yeah, hang on one second. I need all my props. I'm getting old, so I need to just refer to my notes here for a second. Um, so this talk is a two-parter. 
The first part is therapy, where I tell you about my problems. And the second part is a call to action, where I tell you how you can help me. Um, so I, I have a problem, I take the train. And that, that was, <laughs> and, um, and <laughs> it took a while, you got there, you got there. <laughs> um, um, and I want a, not unreasonably, I'd like a usable, smart way to find out when my train is leaving so I can be there. Unfortunately, Jason's laptop doesn't like the internet. Well, I think the internet um, doesn't like. Yeah, so, so the, I was going to show you the options. The options are Cape Metro has a lovely HTML and PDF versions of their timetables, which are awful, especially if you're trying to, if it's in the rain and you're trying to look it up on your phone, they're terrible. They also have a, a mobile initiative called Go Metro or something, which is just horrible. The, the URL is an IP address, so I'm not waiting around for Cape Metro to get off their butt. There, there's one other. <laughs> what, XML RPC? I, for, for fetching data. I take XML RPC over passing HTML and PDF, eh? So, so that, that is the call to action. Um, Bradley Whittington, who is somewhere here, has graciously, yes, thank you, LazyWeb. He's written some Python code to, to scrape Cape Metro's HTML. Also, he doesn't get to be late for work. So, so thanks to Bradley, we have some code. Um, and here's the call to action. So anybody that loves Python, all of you, and is interested in scraping HTML and being on time for your trains, um, the plan is to use this Python code to generate some clean data sets of JSON or CSV, upload them somewhere else so that all you people with good taste in the audience can build me a nice train site. Okay, get on it, guys. That's <laughs> Um, this is perhaps a good time to mention that Maciej, our next speaker, will also be speaking tomorrow in a full talk slot. Um, Gadi from Nigeria um, had his visa application fall through. Um, so Maciej will be talking tomorrow in place of Gadi, um, and Maciej will be talking about um, writing a PHP interpreter using the PyPy toolkit. Yes. <laughs> Um, and now he's, and now he's going to tell you how to make a living um, while writing open source software. Okay, hello. Uh, so a few words about open source. So open source is really big. Like a lot of people uh, use open source. A lot of people write open source. Open source powers most of the world's IT infrastructure, which means that like all the server side stuff these days is essentially open source, except some cloud solutions or some like internal company solutions, and except Microsoft, which is kind of in the retreat. Uh, among other things, that means that if you want to write infrastructure projects, and I really like writing infrastructure projects, you have to write open source, otherwise nobody will use it. Uh, it's a problem. Uh, it's cool projects, even cooler people, uh, and by contributing, you learn a lot. So the problem is like, yes, I write open source in my free time, and, but then I have to go to work and like make some websites. Uh, so uh, making money from open source is tricky. Uh, it's not easy, it's not for everyone, but uh, if you're a student, if, if you're just beginning, I would suggest going for Google Summer of Code or other programs. PyPy was running uh, programs like that. Raspberry Pi Foundation is running programs like that. You can get internships, you can get school credit, you can get a lot of stuff. Uh, Google Summer of Code is like $5,000 for three months of work, which is absolutely horrible in the States, but here it's not that bad. So if you're a student, really do apply. Google will pay you to write open source software for three months, and you can sit at home and do whatever you like. <laughs> as long as you write software. <laughs> If you're not a student, there are various companies that uh, mostly write open source. So Mozilla comes to mind. 
Uh, Prickled comes to mind, Rockspace employs tons of people like Alex Gaynor and uh, Glyph Lefko no, Glyph works for Apple. Uh, but the, there are tons of people, Jesse Noller works for Rockspace. Uh, Red Hat is employing a lot of people like Dave Malcolm uh, and a lot of other people. I'm hiring open source people. If you are looking for a job and want to do something pretty obscure, come to my talk tomorrow. <laughs> and there is quite a bit of open source funding. Uh, as a PyPy project, we managed to raise something like $120,000 in the past two years, which is maybe not a whole lot of money, but seems to be quite enough to fund quite a lot of cool projects. Uh, so in summary, it's possible to live uh, from writing open source, which is very cool. And it also seems to be one of the few ways to actually write infrastructure that other people use. Uh, this lightning sh talk is quite short, so if you want, just come and talk to me. I don't bite, usually. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as soon as you get the video going, um, I'm talking about, well, I assume most of you know nose tests. Pretty much everyone seems to be using it. So do we. And nose tests allows you to have plugins. And can you see anything? No. Okay. Can you see anything now? Hey. Yay. Okay, cool. Now I lost all my window. <laughs> Where did they go? Oh, this is here. Okay. Right, so now I can't see my slides, but that should. Ah! <laughs> Maximized to the wrong desktop. Okay, okay. Okay, no worries. Let's just uh, make that a bit smaller. <coughs> But is it left or right? Oh, there we go. Yo. Um, unfortunately, it's an NVIDIA nonsense, so you don't get to use the normal, normal stuff. Oh, that's good enough. OK, right, so that's me. I also work at STA. This is my whole, this is, oh, why radio telescopes? It's supposed to say why nose progressive. Sorry about that. <laughs> Well, radio telescopes are cool because they, uh, <laughs> because you can install them with PIP, right? Um, also, it's a very simple plugin for nose tests. It lets you uh, know how far your tests have run. It hides unnecessary outputs, so your screen is much cleaner once you've finished running the test. And it lets you quickly go to the right place in your editor, and it lets you quickly uh, cut and paste tests that have failed. So now it's on to the demo. Let's see. Oh, now this is going to be hard because I can't see it. Uh, okay. I'm just going to do this. Right. Okay. Um, so, normally when you run a test, test, you have no idea how many tests there are, you have no idea how long it will take. You just get a little dot, oh, it wasn't too bad, it was five seconds, but sometimes tests take a lot longer to run and you, you get annoyed. So uh, after you run the pip command I showed you, you just add dash dash with progressive. And oh, look at that, it's a progress bar. Hooray. OK. And uh, now, now I'm going to try and introduce an error into my code. That should be quite easy. Uh, where am I? This is actual SKA code, so I can commit this. So, this might look familiar to some people in the audience. Let's just, uh, not that. <coughs> Let's just put something that doesn't exist in there. Uh, oh, oh boy. Okay, so the missing terminal. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, now we run it. No, we don't run that. <laughs> we did that. Okay, now you can see two nice things. It prints out an editor compatible string, which you can just, you can just select the line and paste it. Okay. Oh, all right. I can't use, I usually use Emacs, but anyway, so, no, what's this? It's not right. <coughs> oh well, it's also. I don't know, what did I just do? Oh, of course, it's uh, it's got a space in front of it. 
Oh, okay, I'm an idiot. Okay, well, that happens on occasion. Well, let's try this again. <laughs> I think this will work. All right, so now I can uh, hit that line which I understand. Okay, never mind. Well, <laughs> well, anyway, that plus 30. Well, yeah, sure. Okay, so, but the point is, looking for the epic failure. <laughs> if we can try this, this should be here. Right, okay. Oh, more epic fail. It's very hard to type like this. Okay, let's run it one more time. And now I can just go and cut and paste this, yes, yes, and it takes me to the right place, so, well, I mean, it depends, you get the idea, right, it tells you, it says, your editor plus the line number, and then you can cut and paste it, and you go directly to the right place, another cool thing is, here you get a form of a test name, which you can also cut and paste, so if I now just say this, and I say, paste that, it will run just the one test, so, that's a backbone of a normal nose output. You can't, you can't easily edit the file. You have to kind of go, oh, it's line 110, look in the back, trace back, and then uh, go to the new editor. And also, you can't easily, if, if a single test fails, you have to kind of figure out, you have to say, run this file colon class dot <laughs> method name, whereas here you can actually just cut and paste it, and that's all there is to it. Thank you very much. Next up, we have David Fraser telling us about putting bugs back into your code. Okay, so if we have enough time, can I do two lightning talks in five minutes or less? I don't know, can okay. We'll see. So what are we going to do is, so we, we discovered a new software development practice at our company recently, which is not listed in like the Agile Manifesto or in the XP principles or anything, but it's very important and it's called rebugging. So what this is, is actually much easier than debugging, which is really fun, but takes a long time. What you do is you find a commit that fixes a bug, and then you just say git revert, and then you push it, let everybody use it. It works fantastically, the bug will reappear exactly the way it was before, and on your track ticket, you'll get a nice little message after all the like, oh, we're trying to find out what's going on, oh, we fixed it, here's it's landed, okay, we pushed it to the customers, like, they're all using it happily, revert. And then you don't need to add any description to why you did that. And then afterwards, the beauty of this, you see, is when the customer comes and reports the bug, it's now so easy to fix. <laughs> well, you know, right. well, you know, I know you had that before, but listen, we really know how to fix this bug. We've done it once before. Okay, so that's rebugging, and I recommend you all use it. It makes you much happier and generates much hilarity in your um, meetings. Okay, um, so, but then I had a second lightning talk, which I didn't prepare, which was because of what he was talking about earlier about the train. So I have this little module which I wrote because I don't like using banks' websites to download statements from them. Does anybody else feel this? So I've got a little module which um, will download bank statements in a scripted way from Standard Bank and Discovery, and I think it should work with FNB. So, and that's also up on GitHub, so if anybody is interested in doing that. So I kind of thought like maybe there's a broader thing than just trains that needs addressing here, that like there are all these people who produce websites in South Africa who don't know how to produce APIs that other people can use, and maybe we should just take their websites over and do screen scraping and make our own APIs. So, um, so I started with finance things. So if anybody's interested in that, then um, come and chat to me as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and by the way, the Discovery website. Oh my word. <laughs> At least the online banking one. Like, have you tried to use that thing? discoveryonlinemaking.co.za. They were inventive about that, and they were very inventive about the way they use JavaScript and HTML. <laughs> yes, yes. But it's worse because it's old and strange, not because it's new and totally unique and, like, weird. You want this over the... Yes. No, no, it's fine. Thank you.
good good thing good thing that I checked my projection just before. <laughs> so what I want what I want to show you is um, a Python module, it's called CFFI, so it's going to be a slightly more technical talk than most previous talks here. So the goal of the CFFI module is, well, here I am on Linux. Did you know that it has a function called f stat at? That's just a completely random function from the, well, from the Linux standard uh, API. Okay. It, it does cool thing, you can read it, etc. It's similar to stat, actually. Uh, now, now, it, well, this man page is, of course, designed for a C user. Now you are a Python user, obviously. So how do you call this from Python? Yes, okay, okay. <laughs> it says, the, well, yes, what, La what Larry mentioned is that it's actually, uh, it is actually uh, supported in Python 3.3, .3, this particular function. But let's say you're still using 2.7. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so the, the goal is well. You can write a C extension module. Basically, takes pages of code just just to call this simple function. Okay. So I want to show you an, an another way, which is using the module called CFFI. That's very. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, just let me hold it. <laughs> okay, does this work? Does this work? Okay, so with the CFFI module, well, CFFI stands for an FFI, so a foreign function interface, in order to call C, obviously. <coughs> so what I'm doing is I call C def, triple quote. Okay, what do I put here? Man f stat, copy. Up, copy paste. Okay, but this needs actually the struct stat. But then, well, what is the struct stat in C? What does it contain? It contains tons of stuff. Well, I can see actually more or less what it contains here. <coughs> oh great, all these fields. I don't know, I'm interested in only in getting the size, actually. So I want only this field, and while well, it contains other stuff, okay. And then, if I look in uh, f stat at, sorry. Um, I want this special value here because I want to use it in my code. So what is it actually? It's a define, right? Define, but what is the value? I don't know, so I'm going to put dot, dot, dot. Okay. <coughs> then another obscure command. And here I need to put, well, what are the includes that I need actually? Well, this, these two probably. Here are the includes. Don't care too much, but let's try. Oops, I get a failure. What is a failure? The field is declared as four bytes, but actually it's eight bytes. So my, my CFFI module actually figured out that this field here is eight bytes, not four. 
so well. Okay, let's fix this. Okay. So what can I do now? Well, I can just call it f stat at, and here I want uh, the constant value at f d c w d. Well, f d c w d. Okay. The second argument is path name. So path, a struct stat star buff. So it's a buff that I want to get out the stat. So I need to allocate it. <coughs> so what does this line mean? This line means I want a variable buff that is of type struct stat star and well, should should be initialized to point to a fresh new struct stat. Okay, so I pass buff and then flags zero. I'm going to ignore the return value and print the result buff dot what st size. And that's it. <laughs> Okay, well, th that's my lighting dog. <laughs> so, the <laughs> so it's a, it's about the CFFI module, which is well, some way to use C libraries from Python. Once he has done his little dance. We're going to work. Yay. Okay, so now we have Maltus Smick. Okay, cool. So um, I'm borrowing someone's laptop and trying to do presenting and stuff. So Code Speed 2 is really cool. Uh, Maciej, can you stand up and wave your hands in the air? And I'm in, because you're both really cool. Okay. Cool, so those guys basically needed um, benchmarking, and they have Code Speed. Okay, I'm just going to hold that in with my one hand and try to use my mouse without this. This is like lightning extreme talk. Um, I don't know if anyone else noticed, but we're doing um, light night talks, actually, it says on the slides. Uh, points for noticing. Okay, so um, while that's being held in there, and I don't know why it's falling out, uh, we're going left or right? Or up or down? Uh, oh, oh, up. up. Woohoo. Okay, so um, code speed two. Much as said, uh, they're using code speed. It kind of sucked for what they wanted to do because it didn't have tests and it was hard to refactor and rework. So um, we said we'd donate a bunch of our team weeks to, to do it, and the PSF said they'd fund the other half, and we started rewriting code speed two. Uh, uh, code speed as code speed two. The, yeah, the text that it uses is MongoDB, a bit of Cyclone, and does cool stuff. It's on, Py, it's on PyPy's Bitbucket, so you can find it there. Uh, what it looks like, kind of like existing code speed, except it's using D3 for the graphs, so that's quite a lot cooler with a bit of a learning curve. Um, and stuff has tests. I won't show you tests now, but it means you can change things. Um, then if you're interested in, say, AI, you could click on it, and if this were not a live demo, that would work. Um, uh -huh. I don't know what I've just done. Either I'm not clicking the mouse correctly, but I can also just type in the box below because typing is often faster than mousing. Um, and either I've lost internet, which is also possible. There we go. Okay, summary for benchmark AI revision latest comes up. And before the graphs were horrible because you had a tiny one up here with the slow um, C Python implementation stuff, and then down here you, oh, sorry, the non-JIT, and then you had JIT down the bottom going nice and quickly. Um, so now they've been split out onto two graphs, and if you've got an interesting portion, you can just take a look and see what was happening there and why it was happening. 
Um, when you grab any point in this, uh, you've got the revision number, and in the next week we do, when you click on that, you'll actually see that revisions data. Right now, we've got the revisions down below. You can grab any one revision you're interested in. Uh, we pull up that revision, and then down here we have a really uninteresting graph, which has one data point on it in the middle, um, which we can't even see. But the interesting thing in PyPy is warm-ups. Uh, now, now that some of the harder problems have been solved, warm-ups become more interesting, and old PyPy code speed runner gave you one data point, um, the average. Now we have got a new data format which gives you all of the runs, and then we do the averaging and stuff on the server. So this graph starts to look pretty interesting, and you can actually see the warm-ups that have been invisible until now, up till now, and they've only been visible in numbers, and now they're graphed wonderfully. Uh, and that is graphed on a revision that we call 2001 at the moment. It's our oddity revision, which has been handcrafted. Our next sprint will be in a few weeks. I'll be able to give you the details afterwards. If you're keen, you're welcome to come and join us for that week. It's open source. Colab is open. Um, the source is there if you want to do it in your own free time, but we'll be working in the office in the next week. Um, our web page is currently unavailable. Where's Petrus? Yeah, okay. So Petrus has a service for keeping co.za name servers renewed, uh, name services renewed. We don't use that service, and yesterday we lost our domain name, and I've paid for it now. Um, thankfully, uh, we have labs.ws, which is our, our weekly model, so if you need to get hold of us as well, you can go to labs.ws and repeatedly try clicking on this link that says Working Software Labs is a division of information logistics, and when you click on that and the name server works, you'll actually get to our real website and be able to get hold of us on there and see the, when the sprints are scheduled and things. Um, so in the flavor of live demos, I, I never expected our domain name to be down today, but it wonderfully is. Cool. Um, so that's a whirlwind tour of CodeSpeed 2. Basically, you can click through. It's so simple that you can get it. How am I doing on time? Um, okay, if someone's given me two minutes, then I'm going to copy the other guy, also called David, who also runs a software co company in Cape Town, who also learned to program on a ZX Spectrum. Um, and do another lightning talk. Great, great. We need Larry's lightning talk next. Oh, I thought I had two minutes on this talk. No, Larry has two minutes. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> then I'm not going to do another lightning talk, and I'm just instead going to say go to CodaDojo.com, check out the Cape Town Coda Dojo, and it explains itself. Ooh, cool. I would like a microphone. Oh, I thought you had the <laughs> Yeah. You? Yes, and yes, I better not really literally have two minutes. This is take a little bit more than that. So go with the grain of the pickle. This is about the uh, pickle module, in case you hadn't guessed. So um, there are three binary serialization libraries built into Python. Um, there is pickle, marshal, and shelve. Now, marshal, I mentioned earlier today, that's something used for PYC files. It can change, uh, perhaps even violently, between point releases it's an unending sea storm of changes. You don't want to touch Marshall. Just don't use it. Um, Shelve is really Pickle uh, with the DBM module plugged into it, so it doesn't get you anything beyond what Pickle does. So really, actually, you're going to use Pickle. If you want to use something built into Python and do binary, binary serialization, you're going to use Pickle. But Pickle's a little weird. Um, it's, uh, you kind of have to warp your program around Pickle a little bit because of the constraints that Pickle places on you. And this talk is basically what I learned when I did that for an application I was working on. Um, I was writing an implementation of a popular card game in Python uh, called uh, Meal, short for Mealborn. Um, it's command line. It's, it's like scrolling text, but it only runs on Linux because I wanted key presses to be reactive, so it doesn't work on Windows yet. But anyway, I wanted to save and restore all my binary state um, so that you could just kill the program and pick up where you left off anytime you wanted. And obviously, I was going to use Pickle for that. Um, I'm using it, uh, it's all written in Python uh, 3 specifically, and I wanted to automatically save and restore. So there were a bunch of surprises that I encountered when I was doing this. The first one is dunder init on your classes is not called when you unpickle an object. When you unpickle an object, you load in all the bytes off of the disk, and then you sort of reconstitute the object in memory. When you reconstitute that object, you don't call init. Um, this means that, for instance, if you want to add a new member to a class, um, if you do it inside of the init, well, that init isn't going to get called, and so now you're going to have an instance of that object that you've unpickled that doesn't have field or name. So what you really want to do is, when you add a new field, you want to add it at class scope, 
and set it to some nice static value that's immutable. If you have something that's going to be a mutable thing like a list or something, then you're going to have to do something like add a new Dunder call on your class that automatically gets, that you call by hand when you unpickle the object, you were going to call this other thing. Um, but if you can live with immutable values, then you should do that. The second thing that's surprising is that Dunder new is called because new is used to construct objects. And so they actually creates a new object and then splats in all of the values from uh, the pickled serialization format. So Dunder init is not called, Dunder new is. Uh, the third thing that surprised me, so this is kind of badly worded. All pickled classes must be at module scope and consistently named. What I mean by that is if you're doing something clever, where you're recreating your own type, your own types at runtime with uh, type. You know how type can take one parameter and that'll tell you the type of the thing, or it'll take three parameters. In which case, it'll create a new type object. Um, if you're using that, then um, you need to make sure that every type that you create is at module scope, and the type, th uh, the name that you give the class is the same as the name of the variable. Because the way that pickle works, it actually writes down the names of your classes and what module it got it from, and then when it recreates the objects later, it goes and looks up those classes by name inside the module that it finds <laughs> by name, and it recreates the object by calling new. And so if you can't find those names, if they aren't consistent, then pickle is going to fail when it tries to reconstitute the object. And finally, um, it's uh, well known that uh, pickle will very cleverly maintain the references to an object. So if you have an object and there's four references to it, like it's an addict, it's a list, and it's stored in an, another object over here somewhere, and you serialize all that and you reconstitute it, um, all of those references will be consistent. You'll actually have one object and those references will be recreated all pointing to the same object. It's very nice, but that only works inside of a single call to dump. If you call dump multiple times, you dump different objects, and those different objects happen to have the reference to the same object, it'll actually, when you reconstitute it with several um, serial load of calls, um, those will be different objects now. So you really want to only ever want to make one call to dump. So uh, my solution to this um, is that I passed in a single dict and every piece of global scope that I wanted to save and restore, I stored in that dict. And when I would dump, I would stick them all in the dict and dump that. And when I would restore, I would load that single dict and then reassign them back to the globals. And that is exactly how I recommend you use Pickle in the future. That's it. Thanks very much. Cool. Um, that's it for the lightning talks this afternoon. Um, I now, well, first of all, um, we'll be back here again tomorrow morning. Uh, if you come at 8.30, you can get coffee. If you come at 9, you'll be in time for Matt Hampton's keynote. If you come after that, you'll be missing part of his keynote, which is um, on how he failed to do caching. And I think um, since that's, what, the second hardest problem in computer science? <laughs> um, we've, probably all, we've probably all failed many times to do this. Um, yes, so now I want everyone to stand up. <laughs> cool.